I do have a background in physics, but I'm doing a PhD here in DCU and in the physics department and the BDI. And I have, during my PhD, ventured more into the area, which is a little more interdisciplinary, of uh, disease detection and biomedical diagnostics. Um, my talk today is just a pinprick, the next generation of disease detection. So we all know the general setup when you're sick. You don't feel well, so you go and see your doctor. They can't figure it out, so they take a blood sample, which is sent off to some centralized lab somewhere. You have to wait days or even weeks for the results to come back. Now, I don't know about you, but I end up Googling all the terrible diseases known to man, and I have myself dead and buried before the results even get back. <laughs> However, with a point of care device, results can be generated in-house, right there in your GP's office. And this can be done in a matter of minutes. As you can imagine, this could have huge implications for places like the developing world, where people have to travel great distances to receive medical care. If you can run the test and generate the results then and there, it allows for much better and more tailored treatment of disease. Unfortunately, this is easier said than done when it comes to detecting diseases like cancer using a point of care device. To detect cancer from a blood sample, it's quite a complicated process. And one method of doing it is to look for specific markers in the blood that allow you to find the cancer. And for that, we use RNA. And RNA is present in all cells, but it's also highly specific. So if you have elevated levels of certain RNAs, it's an indication that there is cancer there. The problem is that in order to detect these RNAs, you have to first of all isolate them from the rest of the blood. To do this, there's a lot of pro uh, processes, but the first is mixing the blood with a certain chemical which allows you to isolate the RNA and leave everything else behind. Unfortunately, doing this in a lab takes a long time. You're sitting there sort of pipetting for hours, and it's quite a complicated process. My work uses the area of centrifugal microfluidics to solve this problem. So uh, microfluidics is the science and technology of fluid flows on the micron or submicron scale. Now, that seemed a lot smaller before Greg's talk, but it's still pretty small. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, centrifugal microfluidics, on the other point, uses the centrifugal force, which is directly proportional to the density of the particle or fluid, rho, the distance from the center of rotation, or, and the square of the angular velocity, omega. For example, imagine yourself sitting in the passenger seat of a car going around a roundabout. You feel this pull into the door of the car. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're here or here, you still feel that same pull. The only thing that does matter is how fast you're going and how close you are to the center. So I use this really simple physical phenomenon to control how fluids move through a microfluidic disc. And here's one of my discs. So the discs are about the size of a CD or DVD. They're made up of multiple layers. You normally have two to three layers of a hard see-through plastic, which is held together using pressure-sensitive adhesive, or PSA. And that's basically just double-sided sticky tape that um, gets, gives better adhesion the more pressure you put on it. Uh, our lab has the ability to manufacture these discs from scratch. So we use a laser cutter or a milling machine to cut the structures from the plastic layers. And we use a precision knife cutter to cut the, the structures from the PSA layers. Uh, and then finally, we assemble all the, discs, the layers together and you end up with a disc that kind of looks like this. Have a look. <laughs> So each disk contains multiple identical uh, structures, so you can run more than one test at once, which is really important in these point-of-care diagnostics. The, now into a bit of the biology. The specific application of the work that I've been doing during my PhD is on the extraction and purification of these RNAs for the detection of diseases like uh, breast cancer. So the protocol for this can be broken down into two stages. The first is extraction whereby you have to extract the RNA from the rest of the blood. This is done by mixing a droplet of blood, 25 microliters, with all the necessary chemicals. This causes cell lysis, whereby the cells are torn open, letting everything that's inside, including the RNA, into a solution. You then mix a bit, and as you do, the RNA, which is less dense than everything else, separates away into what we call the aqueous phase, which sits on top. You then extract the aqueous phase. So. And here's the disc we use to do it. OK, so first of all, you load your chemicals and your blood, and then you start spinning your disc. The centrifugal force pushes the liquid outwards to the edge of the disc, just like with the car going around the roundabout. 
But because of this little channel here, the liquid has nowhere to go but up into those side arms, where it traps and compresses the air inside. Now, if you spin a little slower, that air pushes back, forcing the liquid back up into that central chamber. If you do this over and over again, you get this effective mixing of the two fluids. Your final step is to slow down even more. That air pushes back further, forcing the liquid to a level that's higher than that channel, and it can flow down. You can then collect your sample ready for stage two. So what I have here is the spin frequency profile for the disk I just showed you. So after your initial loading, you spin up really, really fast, up to 100, her or, yeah, 100 hertz for 20 seconds. Then you begin your uh, compression relaxation cycles. Each one of them takes about 20 seconds, and you do this for 30 cycles. Then you finally slow back down again to move the liquid over that channel and stop the disk. This whole process takes about, or about 10 minutes, but it's completely automated. So we have a program that runs it. You just push a button and go off and make yourself a cuppa and come back. Um, so I have a video, which I hope works, of this happening with a real blood sample. And it might, yes, OK. It's a little slow. OK, so the fluids are loaded and the disk is spun. As it cycles back and forth between fast and slow, you get this separation of the RNA in an aqueous phase. I'm not sure if you can see in the video, but it's a little clearer bit on top. So that's the water bit that leaves everything else behind. Then you slow the disk down, the liquid reaches that level, and it can pass over and be collected. So basically, in 10 minutes, and um, with just the push of a button, I'm able to collect my extracted RNA sample, ready to be brought into phase two. So stage two. Stage two is the purification. You have to purify the RNA before it's capable of being detected. To do this, you take your aqueous phase that you do from stage one, you mix it with a buffer to bring it up to 120 microliters. You then mix all that together with glass beads. And what happens is the RNA binds to the beads through electrostatic interactions. And then you wash the beads with organic solutions, uh, isopropanol, IPA, and ethanol. And finally, with water, which then takes the, the RNA back off the beads, and you can collect it for detection and analysis. Unfortunately, this is, this is quite difficult to do on a microfluidic disk because you have to be able to detect or to collect a sample at the end that's been washed by all of these samples but isn't contaminated by them. So what we had to do in order to handle all these, these liquids was come up with a way to do it on our disk. And what we did was we brought in two new materials to incorporate into our disk. The first one is a hydrophobic membrane, which is here, HM. And basically, that is, it repels aqueous solutions. Water, it doesn't let them through, but it does allow the organic solutions, our IPA and our ethanol, to pass straight through as if it's not even there. The second is a dissolvable film. And that dissolves when it comes in contact with water, but is completely unreactive to the organic solutions. So as a basic proof of principle, we put one of our membranes, our hydrophobic membrane, into this disk. Then we loaded a water solution. So the idea with this disk is that the liquid has been designed, or the disk has been designed so that the liquid preferentially wants to travel to the left. But the passageway has been blocked by this hydrophobic membrane. Then, if we spin our disk, the aqueous solution encounters the membrane, can't get through, and in panel two there, you can see it's been collected completely on the right. But if we put an organic solution in, it passes through the hydrophobic membrane and is collected in the left. <coughs> So we expanded on this sort of basic principle to be able to handle all the fluids we needed to do our purification of our RNA. And this is the disk that does it. So just draw your attention to a few things. The first is up here we have our glass beads. These aren't drawn to scale. The beads themselves are about less than 100 microns. So there are thousands of them in that little chamber. And that barrier underneath kind of works like a net. So it holds the beads in the chamber, but allows the liquid to pass through. Here we have a hydrophobic membrane, so that's the one that lets your organic solutions but doesn't like the water. We have our dissolvable film, which dissolves in the water. And here we have a siphon valve as well, which gives us further control over how the fluids move through the disk. Right, so step one, you load your aqueous solution, the one we took off that first disk I showed you. you the RNA is left on the beads, and then you start spinning the disk. So once again, the liquid is forced outwards towards the edge of the disk by our centrifugal force. But once it encounters the hydrophobic membrane, it can't pass through because it's water-based, travels over the siphon, past the dissolvable film, dissolving as it goes. The dissolvable film can take a, a, 
a few seconds or up to a minute to dissolve. And in that time, the liquid gets collected down here in chamber four. You then load your organic solution, your first one, your IPA, and start spinning the disc. This time, though, the liquid encounters the hydrophobic membrane and can pass through, and it's collected down in chamber two. Your second organic solution follows the same path. Finally, you add your water, your last bit. The RNA unbinds from the beads after it's, it's been nice and clean now. It's resuspended in the water, and you start flowing. Once again, it can pass through the hydrophobic membrane, travels over the siphon, but now that dissolvable film was dissolved away in the first point, uh, or in the first stage, and it collects in chamber three. So the idea now is that we've spun all of this and been able to collect a completely uncontaminated sample down there in chamber three at the end that's ready for detection and analysis. Uh, again, just another graph. I like talking to physicists. You can show them graphs. Everyone else just gets really freaked out when you do. <laughs> so after the initial loading, there's a five-minute waiting period where that water solution is in contact with the beads. It gives the time for the RNA to bind to the beads. Then you spin up and move the liquid along. The IPA and the ethanol have to be spun really fast because they're very viscous fluids and they like, or they're not very viscous fluids, and they like to travel over that siphon. So we spin very, very fast to encourage them more to go through the, the hydrophobic membrane instead, which they do. There's a drying period then after the ethanol, which is needed to dry the hydrophobic membrane and the siphon for the final stage. And then in this, finally, the solution period here, you are, um, use it to take the RNA off the beads again and resuspend it in the water, which you then collect. So again, another nice video. Uh, this one is done with some uh, food dyes, just to clearly illustrate what's happening. Um, that whole process, I should mention, takes less than 25 minutes. But remember, you can run multiple tests at once. In fact, on that disk there, you can fit four of them just on one disk. Uh, and in this video here, I um, should mention that the videos are taken, we do this in real time, so we can monitor what's happening in real time when we're testing these disks. So what happens is you have a, a camera and a strobe light which takes a snapshot image every time the disk does one rotation. Then we stitch all, <laughs> we stitch all the images together uh, to make our video. So this video is sped up though, <laughs> is sped up a lot, so we won't be here for the next 25 minutes, don't worry. Uh, Oh, not so much. Okay, so again, that's our first aqueous solution. It's loaded, the RNA is being left on the beads, and then the liquid is flowing over to chamber four, dissolving the film as it goes. Then we have our organic solutions, uh, yep. our IPA first, and then our ethanol. Again, they pass through the beads, washing them as it goes, making our RNA nice and pure. Then uh, finally, after, sorry, it's a bit slower. Finally, we're going to load our water at the end, which Again, uh, takes the RNA off, resuspends in the water, and can be collected over in chamber three. So this disc uh, gives you complete control over how the fluids move, and in that way allows you to collect your completely uncontaminated sample at the end. So if we put all this together, what we have is a disc or a device that takes in a droplet of blood and gives you out a clean and uncontaminated sample which can be used to detect your RNA. And actually, we, our results have shown that we are capable with these disks of detecting the RNA and therefore the cancer at levels that are on par with the current standard benchtop methods. But the difference is all of this happens in 45 minutes and it, we're well on our way to making it a completely automated process. So that means you'll just be able to load your samples and walk away, which is what you need for a point of care device. You want to be able, anyone, you want someone in a doctor's office or someone in um, the middle of Africa to be able to use these devices. You don't want them to be in any way complicated. Um, but what I've shown you here is just the first step. So by the end of my PhD, I want to be able to have a device that's capable of taking in your droplet of blood, running all the necessary extraction and purification steps, doing the detection right there and then. And all of this would be done on a small portable device that could be used anywhere in the world. And all of that from just a pinprick of blood. Thank you very much. All right, now you know what physics does for disease detection. So is there anything that you want to ask Jennifer about her, her work? Sorry, just, I mean, is there a realistic time scale? 
Yeah, in fact, we're already, it, we, what I've shown you there is just some of the disks that I use, and I'm using it looking for breast cancer. We have other stuff in the BDI that's already at the stage where it's, we're linking with companies who are making these devices much more usable right now. I'm, I mean, we're not talking 30 years, we're talking two, three, five years time before these kind of devices are going to be out there, yeah. <coughs> Yeah. Oh, that, there's, um, yeah, that's kind of the, the, the next stage. There's a few different methods. We can tag the RNA to make it fluorescent, to make it glow. And then it's kind of like an on-off switch, a bit like with your uh, a pregnancy test. You either have it there or you don't. So in that case, you need to be able to identify the specific levels that you need. Like, everybody has these RNAs in their, in their blood, but it's whether you have an elevated level is what's important. So that's, that's kind of, as I said, I'm the physicist, so I leave that to the biologists and they figure that stuff out for me and tell me what to, to do with it at the end. And I suppose one of the things Jen would say is the research centres in DCU, like the Biomedical Diagnostic Institute, has a close collaboration with medical practitioners and clinicians and industries in this area. So that's kind of the way research is now. It's, it's not in one box. <coughs> Are there any other diseases other than Oh God, everything. <laughs> we, uh, we have some people who are detecting, well, cancer is a big one, definitely, but we have pe uh, people who are working on HIV and other infectious diseases. I mean, it, it really, if you can detect it in a lab, you can detect it with a device like this. The, the difficulty becomes, like Greg said, in miniaturizing these things so that you're able to look at them using a small device, not a big bloody machine. But yeah, no, I would say there's, there's no limit to what you can do. Is it affordable? Oh yes, most definitely. It's cheap. That piece of plastic there would be. But the technology to read it and automate it. Oh well, that would be that would be your big purchase. So that would be like your computer. You'd buy your thing, but it could be run with the laptop or anything. You saw there that it would be a Discman type thing. That's maybe a little bit ambitious. It'd probably be a slightly bigger box than that. But most definitely, it would be the idea would be that the the discs themselves would be cheap, disposable, reuse or not reusable. But you buy your machine once, and that would be what you'd be using then. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. I want to try and get up, get, get, get to the program.